Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. We are bringing it full circle. It is Wednesday, July 29th, and I am here with my new anchor. Stephanie Tapley, that's me. Oh, yeah. You see this picture right here? Do y'all see this picture right here? This is her in the flesh, folks. This is her in the flesh. Our new anchor. Stephanie, can you tell the people where you're from? Because I think last week I totally made a mistake on where you're from. So, Well, I'm actually from Wiley, Texas. But for people that are out of state, they're like, I don't even know where that is. So Dallas, Fort Worth area is pretty much what we say. So Dallas area. But I'm a Texas girl. Texas girl. Listen. We are bringing it full circle. I want you guys right now, if you are on Facebook, to make sure you like and share. And also know that if you have any questions, comments on what's going on on this news broadcast, you can hit us on Twitter at BIF Circle. All right, BIF Circle on Twitter. You can also hit our pages up. Um, Andre Robinson, bringing it full circle. And Stephanie Tapley will have a new uh, bringing it full circle page as well on Facebook that you can join her page on and get into it, like uh, Elena Fields would say. Uh, <laughs> vitamin E, shout out to you. Um, all right. So, are you ready? Because I think I'm I think I'm ready. I think I'm, I'm ready, ready for world news. Are you ready for world news? I think I'm, I'm ready. ready. I want to hear it. All right. Yeah. So, you will see a lot of this pretty face coming up. But, nevertheless, we have some things to talk about in world news and i think i'm gonna start off with something that uh everyone would be super interested in and that is the amazon scandal that is going on in las vegas stephanie this is a very interesting topic for you i'm going to let you start off about what you think uh how you feel about this situation with amazon in las vegas well, I'm not familiar with what's exactly happening in Las Vegas, but I do know we've I've had some recent discussions about um, the owner, Jeff Bezos, specifically when it comes to how he is outsourcing and exploiting workers in other countries. And the argument is often when it comes to a lot of people on the right, when they're like, well, he's earned this much money, he's made billions of dollars and, and he's worked hard for it. And I think there's a misconception when it comes to what really it looks like to earn and work for even $1 billion, let alone the multiple billion dollars he has. I think, in fact, I think it's $179 billion, $179.9 billion, I believe. So um, I'll let you continue, but I'll, I have plenty of comments to say about the exploitation and when people are saying, let's keep the jobs in the United States, he's here making, you know, jobs for Americans. That may not be the case. So tell me what's going on in Vegas, and then I'll kind of break down the billion dollar myth um, for everyone that's watching. Absolutely. So Las Vegas Amazon facilities are under multiple state investigations and admitting um, the employee COVID-19 illnesses. Internet juggernaut Amazon is flourishing during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic as people turn to online shopping for supplies. But Nevada authorities are investigating the company after insiders say employees are getting sick and management is slow at revealing the details. In a massive 2.4 square million uh, square foot facility near Salone and Tropical uh, Parkway in Las Vegas, hundreds of Amazon employees file in and help the behemoth internet company deliver everything from ground swimming pools to toothbrushes. Uh, in a public relations video, though, Amazon has been toured for uh, the steps the company has taken to combat the spread of COVID-19. Those precautions uh, include, parking, uh, include mandatory mask wearing. They include employee temp, uh, temp checks, routine building cleaning, and social distancing for employees. But several Amazon employees are speaking out again uh, about their safety. Some people aren't following those precautions. Furthermore, in the break room, and a lot of people, uh, it's hard to come in contact with each other because right they're right next to you, says one inside source from the Amazon wink, wink, wink um, <laughs> building. Uh, another insider definitely uh, feared for retaliation and revealed details. 
She believes the company that brought in $280 billion in 2019 has been slow to reveal new cases of COVID-19. Uh, they're concerned because they're in a warehouse in which they don't know where the new cases are coming from and who has COVID-19. Uh, the trouble started in March when the world began to spread amongst, when it began to spread amongst the world and amongst employees for the possible illness. At the time, the, uh, the corporation uh, allowed unlimited un unpaid time off for employees. The insider also says that management otherwise downplayed the presence of the illness among the employees. Pretty much, don't worry about it, is what they told them. Um, it's all just a rumor. But well, weeks went by, and the company acknowledged cases among employees. The Amazon spokesholder uh, confirmed a case in North Las Vegas facility on April 24th. Mm, sounds interesting. Uh, the company has operated among several, several, all right, several large warehouses scattered around uh, Nevada, in which insiders say concerns spreading. Uh, to from one location to another is a mid uh, investigation right now. The company's public relations team deemed local news reports about the situation to be inaccurate, as they dubbed Lost Two at the time. No reported cases at the facility named Lost Seven. All right. So, Stephanie, how do you feel about this? As uh, it seems like the world is turning as we bring it full circle on what's going on at Amazon. I think transparency is the big um, accountability part here. Um, I think I understand that uh, digital um, supply is extremely high right now um, because everything is restricted on the local level, small businesses as well, um, as well as there's a lot of people that are trying to optimize their time at home um, monetarily. So a lot of the FBA, the um, fulfillment centers with Amazon are being utilized at a higher rate. So it's understandable that there is going to be a high demand for people to have their packages fulfilled by Amazon. Um, however, I still think that safety for, and, and I, this goes for every company in my opinion, what I don't ever understand is I don't, I don't really accept the model of the customer's always right if the compromise is the safety uh, and um, welfare of the workers is at, at risk. So I think um, there needs to be a lot more transparency from leadership in that company as far as the illnesses, um, precautions that are being taken, and actual follow through on those precautions. And it doesn't seem like that's happening. Uh, I love how you come up with solutions. You came up with a solution in, in the midst of talking about what's going on. Stephanie just gave you a solution. And, uh, say it. I mean, implementation is always, you know, more complex, but, but I mean, realistic, I mean, your, your employees have to come first. I mean, uh, I understand bad press. I understand, um, you know, negative reviews. I get it. However, um, it would be serious bad press if you have a whole lot of deaths. So, I mean, with, I mean, bad or bad choice at a certain point, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally and understand. You really can't handle a whole lot more um, negativity. Not that I assume he necessarily cares, but when you are the face of your company or you are represented or a representative, there is a higher level of responsibility and accountability. And when you employ millions and millions of people, you have a um, bigger responsibility to care for those people and be transparent about the care of those people, especially when it comes to the public trust. It's my Listen, if this was a talk show, I would, <laughs> I would click that thing. For sure, she is she is definitely dropping jewels right now. Uh, again, if you are just tuned in to bring it in full circle, this is World and National News. Uh, as we are talking about Amazon, we will have more on this story as we get more, as we get more about it. Uh, we have another story that is very interesting. Obviously, there is a lot of things going on in the United States with travel and people being able to travel certain places. And while all that is going on, where you can't travel certain places, this guy here. Mm, mm, mm. There is a petition currently right now 
to stop Mark Zuckerberg from industrializing or colonizing the Hawaii Island. Yep, colonizing the Hawaii Island as his new mansion went viral. A petition is urging CEO of Facebook, by the way, <laughs> uh, to stop colonizing uh, Kalu, um, Hawaii, as it has garnished over 150,000 signatures. Mark Zuckerberg is the sixth richest man in the world, and he is suing native Hawaiians in Kalu for their land so that he can build a mansion? The change.org petition reads, Hawaiians are already mistreated enough as is. We need to let them have this. Their land is important to them. He's building a mansion? To what? Live in Kalu for two months out of the year? This is inhumane. It's sick. He needs to be stopped, folks. He needs to be stopped, folks. He could literally build a house anywhere else in the world, but he wants to be here with us. <laughs> we don't appreciate that. Well, and the All argument right. from people that are very, very pro, hey, you earn the money, you should have the right to do this or that. It's very important to note that the land he's trying to take is protected indigenous land. That's that's the big issue. That is protected land that government is not fulfilling their end of the bargain. Similar to the Lakota tribe when it comes to um, the uh, Mount Rushmore incident. There are treaties. There are there are protections when it comes to this land belonging to those people. And that's being ignored so that he can start building another mansion. Regardless of whether he has the right to build a mansion or spend his money how he sees fit that's not his land to take. It's again, another colonizer situation where it's just like, I feel like it, I'm going to take it regardless of who it belongs to. That's the issue. Um, outside of the moral or ethical implications of just taking a whole bunch of land so that you can just have this big mansion on acres of property, which could be potentially used for better resources for the Hawaiian people. But it's really about the, the legal and um, ethical issue of taking someone else's land. That's that's the big issue here, in my opinion. So uh, we have comments going on on Facebook right now, uh, Stephanie. I can't, see I can't see him. Davina L. Black Cloud Jackson, what is going on? She is very in, uh, inspirational and very instrumental in the fight for social justices here in the 716. She asked, isn't he a part of Pizzagate? Maybe, maybe that's a whole other uh, deep state conspiracy theory, which uh, evidence is, I was telling Selena yesterday, evidence on uh, some of these sites, it's very, very hard to get deep down to the real root of what is a real document, what is something that we can take at face value, what is something that we can rely on as a reliable source and what isn't. And there's with the ability to doctor documents, it's very hard to tell. There are some suspicious things. There are websites that say that that's been debunked, his involvement with the Podesta emails and Pizzagate. But at this point, the way 2020 is going, I don't know. Everything is a little bit speculation. But either way, he does not have a legal right to take that land. And it looks like he's probably still going to get away with it somehow. So that's a, a problem with the government not fulfilling their end of the bargain. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I definitely um, think that it is not cool whatsoever to take people's native land. We've had this problem for a long, long time now. Over 200 plus years of America, taking, you know it. Yeah, no, taking, absolutely. Wow. All right. In other, in other national news, this one is a, is a, a slobber knocker, a knee slapper too. You see these faces. It looks like a scan. Hmm. Facial recognition? Well, guess what? There's new news that a certain pharmacy... <laughs> this was a neat uh, shocker when I heard it. Um, Rite Aid deployed facial recognition, recognition systems in hundreds of U.S. stores. Whoa. Uh, in the hearts of New York, Metro Los Angeles, Rite Aid has installed... Facial recognition technology in largely lower income, non white neighborhoods. Awesome. 
among the technology the U.S. Uh, retailer used a state-of-the-art system from a company that links to China and its authoritarian government. Over eight years, the American drugstore chain Rite Aid quietly, without all of you guys knowing, added facial recognition software. Uh, when questioned about the facial recognition software and who and what the reasons were for, they said, oh no, it's just to combat robbery and theft. With we're wearing masks right now, is it even gonna work? Um, I can't open my phone with a mask on right now, so. We went to the Maury Povich show and we determined that was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> The Rite Aid store has been has been on multiple occasions caught for facial recognition towards African Americans and Hispanics alike. <sighs> boy, oh boy! What's just your more, okay. just just more cultural divide. Boy, oh boy! Like, how many times are we gonna are we gonna really get rid of these stereotypes? Like. All black people don't steal. In fact, a lot of black people don't steal. There's a lot of Hispanics who don't steal either. Um, why are we targeting one, one, two specific ethnicities? Doesn't make sense to me. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm going to be very honest with you. I have a Rite Aid that's right down the street that I will no longer be going to. As uh, as a pawn to the fact that they might have my face on re facial recognition for no reason, so I'm definitely not going to write it anymore. I will be boycotting. And in fact, um, if you are in the Buffalo, Western New York region, I think we need to uh, put together a petition and a plan in place where we boycott writing. How about that? Solutions, 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 folks. If you are from the 716 area, you can hit me on BIF Circle. And uh, I will tell you that we can definitely put this together. Let's stop spending money at Rite Aid. Well, in part, when you talk about uh, the racial, the um, stereotype, me and I talked about this the other day. We've been conditioned to see us as separate. We, it starts in our public school systems, and that can be another tangent, but it's, it's most people, if you ask who invented the light bulb, most people would say Thomas Edison, rather than say Louis Latimer and Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison owned the company. Louis Latimer created the filament that actually caused the light to shine in the first place. Louis Latimer was a black man, but we're taught in school, we're highlighting the white contributors to our society, and we're downplaying, minimizing, or completely erasing the, the people of color that contributed to our society. So we start to grow up seeing as white people, seeing ourselves highly rep represented in innovation and growth in the country. And we don't really see people of color. So we see ourselves as separate. And then for people of color, they don't see themselves represented. So they even start to have internal biases on themselves. It starts very young and it's perpetuated in our society, public school systems, media, all of that stuff. So it's, it's not a pass, but it's understandable why we got here because we're programmed to have these implicit biases because it keeps us divided. And it's intentional. It's an intentional way to have uh, c continue with the class system because the class system is necessary for the upper elites to be where they are. It's absolutely a, necess a, a necessary evil. So we have to learn to start educating ourselves and each other on the actual truth and coming together on common ground. Or we're gonna to continue to have this. Interesting. Interesting. You have <laughs> definitely put it together in a nutshell. Um, listen, folks, make sure you like, share, support, bringing it full circle news as we bring you real news. Stephanie Tapley is on fire right now. I'm just gonna let y'all know that again, she is on fire. Uh, I am happy to have you uh, here. And again, you will see this. You will see this pretty face a whole heck of a lot, a whole heck of a lot more. Now, 
when we return, because that was uh, world and national news. When we return, yeah, yeah, we've got Alabama news coming up, folks. Alabama news. We'll get into some Wisconsin news. And then the moment that you've been waiting for, everybody, Texas news coming up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, coming up on Bringing the Full Circle. Don't you touch that down. Choice in the backfield. Going deep in the back. He takes it inside the 25. He's working on What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Dad Lewis, and check out sports shows on the fastest growing streaming TV network, the On Point Network. You can stream it on Roku, Amazon, Fire Stick, Apple TV, Xbox, YouTube, and Facebook. Download the On Point channel and network app to any smart device. It's free, everybody. It's free. It's free. All right, all right, all right. We are back. We're bringing it full circle news. Stephanie, how you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am wonderful. I am so wonderful. I'm very excited. I'm super happy. I'm hot um, in the studio, though. These, these lights are... If I start sweating, everyone, my apologies. I'll just be shinier than I normally am. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Absolutely. Hey, so Alabama news is on your way right now. And uh, I'm actually going to throw a little monkey wrench in because this is bringing it full circle. So after Alabama news, folks, we are going to take a quick commercial break. And then you will get Texas news. Texas news will come up. And then I will do Wisconsin and New York news. How about that? All right. Ready, ready, ready. Let's get to it. All right. So. In Alabama news, folks, John Lewis, John Lewis was honored at the Alabama Capitol after procession of Selma. On Sunday morning, Rep. John Lewis left Selma, Alabama for the final time. Red Rose Petals uh, led the way for his final journey covering the pavement that was once stained in his blood when Hordes of state troopers attacked him 55 years ago. This time, the Alabama state troopers saluted, carried a flat drape uh, casket. Lewis uh, passed over the fa uh, fatal, the fateful Edmund Pettus Bridge and was carried to Montgomery along with this, uh, the historic Selma to Montgomery voting rights march, which uh, was en route by a young U.S. representative by the name of Terry Swindell on Sunday. It was poetic justice that Lewis finally crossing state troopers uh, saw him safely to Montgomery after Alabama actions on Bloody Sunday in 1965 when troops led Lewis and 600 others on the Edmund Pettus Bridge with fist and billy club. Images of the racist violence levied against non violent protesters would shock the nation and the march would galvanize the push for national voting rights legislation. In Montgomery on Sunday, people lined Dexter Avenue to witness Lewis's procession to the Capitol steps where family, congregational, uh, congressional uh, colleagues and state leaders awaited. Your thoughts. More, I want to hear your thoughts on this. More racial divide. Uh, I don't know how many times I have to say this, but I'm tired of racial divide. It is absolutely disgusting. I don't understand it. Um, you can't help what you look like. You can't help who you are. You don't have the choice in that manner. Um, why do we do this? Why? It, it, it bedaffles me. And it saddens me as well um, that we have to be subjected to this. And it's like 200, 300 years later, and we still haven't got over this. However, I will say that I'm a silver lining, a small silver lining. 2020 has been bananas. And of course, racial division is just seems like we're in a simulation almost, and we're rerunning. Re previous seasons of Earth uh, as far as the racial tension is concerned. However, 
very recently because of George Floyd's death and the more recent protests, I do feel there are a lot more individuals that are waking up and realizing their own implicit bias, our own history with documentaries like 13th and um, um, When They See Us have been out and available during quarantine. So people have had the option to educate themselves a little bit more. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to change things immediately, but I have seen specifically on Facebook many more people that had been either silent or oblivious to some of these issues or our whitewashed history or whatnot become very much more vocal and aware and engaging in these types of discussions. In fact, there was a... um, A couple of months ago, there was a a group discussion by a woman named Denise Lee here locally that um, runs a um, community conversation group, and she does it on every um, uh, once a month on Monday evenings. And we had 200 people on that call of all different races, all different backgrounds, and that was probably the biggest conversation we had ever had. And it was very eye-opening to see people that had been in the dark for so long about these racial issues, mostly people that were not people of color, um, realizing how bad it is. Because when you're not directly affected by it, you're less likely to see it. And with the media being so in our face now, as opposed to older generations, I do think we have a profound opportunity to really change things now that we are having these discussions very openly, even when it's uncomfortable. So I do think there is a small silver lining of hope, but it's gonna take work. And that means everybody has to participate and everyone has to be more self-aware. Are you seeing that same Uh, shift at all, Andre? uh, I'm seeing the shift a little bit, but here's here's what annoys me the most. What annoys me the most is the fact that um, in the comment on Facebook, from Delindra is John Lewis actually brought people together. I totally get that. But he brought people together on the strength of, again, racial divide. Why can't we just come together just to come together? Right. Same thing with George Why Floyd. Why did he have to die for us to come together? Yeah. Exactly. That's that's my issue. That's my biggest issue. No, um, we should be able to, to just come together to come together. Yeah. Shouldn't have to take all that person, you know, having to suffer or a person uh, dying to be able to come together. Because technically, I mean, that person didn't even get to see how come together. Yeah. Why does there have to be devastating loss in order for people to wake up and, and try to make change? Why can't we just try and prevent that? It's preventative measures. Same thing they'll talk about in medicine. Do the preventative stuff rather than wait and have some sort of catastrophic issue and have a surgery that you can't afford and then you know, you're stuck. It's That makes more sense to me, but I'm not in charge. You and I are not in charge, sadly. Absolutely not. And with that being said, um, we're not in charge of this either, but in Alabama, the eviction ban lift has been lifted. Time is running out for some Alabama renters as the federal eviction ban fired over the weekend. And now millions of uh, Americans risk eviction. Time is running out for thousands of people in Alabama. If Congress doesn't extend protection uh, to renters during the pandemic, the eviction ban had been placed since March 25th and was uh, designed to protect renters in federally backed properties. Uh, It lasted 120 days and ended Friday. Landlords are required to give renters a 30-day notice before they can take legal action. So some renters may uh, be protected until at least August 25th. It is important to note that renters will be required to make back payments on their rent for months they've missed, but they won't have to pay late fees or other penalties. Some Alabamans in these federally backed properties did not receive extra funding from the government, so they cannot afford to pay. What will happen to many of these Alabamans? Hmm, Maybe Trump will get off his behind and actually help, um, and actually help Uh, The Alabamans, hopefully, will see or legislation will actually help the Alabamans. Uh, So with that being said, uh, if you have any comments about any of these topics, uh, people that are watching on Facebook, people that will be watching on the On Point Network later on, you can go to BIF Circle. Hit us up. We want to know your thoughts. Um, What will happen to many of these Alabamans? And with that being said, that is Alabama news for today. I have plenty of Alabama news for tomorrow. 
get ready as we will talk about more than 40 people, including the pastor, tested positive for COVID in Alabama after a church revival in Alabama. We'll also talk about the alcohol sales, uh, board sales. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the uh, Alabama lawmaker says he won't resign after celebrating Klan members um, in Alabama. We will have all that for you tomorrow on Alabama News. In which, let me tell you right now, we are going to take a short break. And when we return, Stephanie Tablin. Don't hype it up so much. Good Lord. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is Texas News coming up, folks. Texas News coming up right after the break. Don't touch that What's dial. Up? This is the one and only Cupid, a.k.a. Mr. I Can Make You Dance, man. And right now, you're checking into the On Point Network. Make sure you stay on top of that, man, on Roku, Fire Stick. Any way you watch your TV, you can catch the On Point Network. Tune in, stay locked. That's what we do. New Cupid! And there's something about the way your love shines on my face. Oh, no, I can never get enough of you. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Texas News in the house. Stephanie Chapley in the house. Let's go. Stephanie. It was more upbeat, but sad to say that there's um, some troubling things that I need to speak on. So the first um, involves in Austin, Texas. So um, you may have heard, but a young man by the name of Garrett Foster was shot and killed at a Austin, Texas Black Lives Matter protest against police brutality on Saturday, July 25th. Um, the shooter's name has not yet been released, um, but he was the driver of a vehicle whom eyewitnesses, including police, agree was driving his car aggressively towards the crowd, posing a threat to their lives. Both uh, the police and eyewitnesses said that the man in the car turned aggressively toward the marchers, and then Foster approached the car. The driver opened fire, shooting Foster three times. He was rushed to a hospital and was later pronounced dead. Now, there are a lot of details on this story, um, which are still developing. There is an impending investigation still, but I do think it's important um, for you to see the clip of the shooting um, involved. Uh, this video was filmed by an independent journalist at the protest. I want to at least advise um, viewer discretion, it is traumatic. <laughs> So that video may not be the easiest to see, and even um, we can put a link potentially in the description so that you can look on it on YouTube. Um, even if you just YouTube the uh, Garrett Foster shooting in Austin, a multitude of different videos will show up. Um, what's unclear to me in the video is exactly who is who in the video, as well as if that black car that you see in that scene is in fact the car. Again, authorities have not released the name of the driver or the vehicle he was driving. So some of these details are unknown. Um, the important thing to also note, Texas is an open carry state. Now, Garrett Foster was actually carrying a AR, um, AK-47 style rifle around his chest, um, and he had been protesting there with his girlfriend for the last 51 days. It is not uncommon to see somebody open carrying in Texas. Um, our laws are, are open carry. So... Allegedly, according to bystanders, the driver, again, was being aggressive towards the protesters. What's unknown still is whether the, the streets were actually blocked off, as they often are when there are protests that are organized, um, 
what's not clear is if the police were enforcing um, these boundaries and these barricades. Um, what's also unclear is, according to Garrett, and I'll show that video in a second, um, the protesters were told they can no longer protest in the street as well. But however, law states that you cannot protest on private property, including most right outside most businesses on the sidewalk, um, in public buildings. So where they were supposed to be protesting is kind of up in the air. Um, so what's also important to note is his fiance, um, the woman you see in this picture, she is a uh, quadriplegic. So she was in a wheelchair and they had been out protesting in the streets, like I said, for about 51 days prior to. If there is a car aggressively coming towards a crowd, especially if his fiance is in a wheelchair and unable to flee the scene out of the way of the car, which legally a car is considered a deadly weapon, it would not be surprising if he approached the car window as these bystanders have alleged. Now, it's still unclear. So far, according to eyewitnesses, no one has seen or did see Garrett aim his gun at the driver of the window. I personally still think even if he had, he would have been within his rights to be defending himself, other protesters, as well as his fiance, who cannot defend herself to get away from this vehicle. Um, but according to eyewitnesses, he did not point his rifle or his gun at the driver. At that point, when he approached the window, according to witnesses, he shot five times. Uh, Garrett was shot three times, according to the report, and was later pronounced dead at the hospital. In the video, you hear an additional three shots. Allegedly, that was another protester who also had a license to carry a gun who shot at the car as he was driving away. Now, the driver of the vehicle turned himself in. He allegedly called the police and turned himself in and let the police know that he was threatened by Garrett Foster, explained that he had the AK-47 and that he approached his vehicle, and that's why he shot. Um, the, it is important to still note that the driver is released. Um, allegedly, there is still an investigation, but they are not releasing his name. And I think that's important especially coming from Second Amendment advocates. Um, Andre, you can uh, jump in on your commentary on this if you want, um, but I personally do support the Second Amendment. I'm not a gun owner. I'm not an NRA supporter, um, but I do think, especially with what we're seeing in Portland with the DHS, I understand the Second Amendment rights. I do think there should be reasonable regulations on guns and we can go into that separately at a different time. However, um, his right to have that gun, he is a, he's a white 28 year old male. He is a former air force veteran and had a license to carry. And yet the NRA, the all lives matter enthusiasts, they're all silent about this death. And I find that very interesting. Um, there is another clip I want to show you. So a lot of people, including the police, um, specifically the police, are blaming or at least implying blame on Garrett for the fact that, well, he had he not had that big threatening rifle, maybe he wouldn't have gotten shot. And I think that is really important because it is in contradiction to a lot of people that support his right to protect himself against not only the government, but other people. And in this particular incident, the car. So I want to play the clip of the interview. Oh, how well, you got it out tonight? They don't let us march in the streets anymore, so I've got to practice some, some of our rights. Now, I think the, uh, I mean, if I use it against the cops, I'm dead. And I think all the people that hate us and, you know, want to say shit to us are too big of uh, pussies to stop and actually do anything about it. So, why just start carrying? Well, our roommate got arrested and they stopped letting us march anywhere, so, start carrying. Hey. I'll also have an exclusive video if you want of uh, the shooting as well. More yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, play that. Again, this may be triggering for some, so if um, if that might trigger you, just pause and come back. 
Absolutely. Um, by the way, you can also uh, continue commentary while the video is playing too, so they can get an understanding. Uh -huh. So for me, it's still really unclear which individuals are which and even slowing it down because I attempted to do that earlier, slowing it down and trying to pause it. It's very hard to tell. So from where I stand, we have to somewhat rely on eyewitness testimony at the scene because this is just very difficult to see. I, I have I even struggled where his fiance's wheelchair was in the in the clip. Um, a little bit. Let's see if we can slow it down. So there's the fiance. All very, very fast. Very upsetting. Very, very upsetting. Um, the, here, go ahead and pause it, Andre, if you don't mind. I think they continue to play the clip, and I don't want to upset anyone unnecessarily. Um, the clip of Garrett speaking, so if you didn't hear him, um, he was asked by the independent journalist, um, by the last name of Garcia, um, why he was carrying. And he said, uh, I think I have the actual quote, but um, essentially he said that if they're not going to let us, they're not going to let us march on the street anymore, I might as well exercise some of my rights. He did say that his roommate had been arrested. Um, I have yet to be able to confirm that. Um, however, we are seeing several protesters being arrested often for no reason or not being cited a reason. Um, he, again, has a right to carry. And even though there are people that are making comments on the colorful language he used and when he made the comment, um, well, if I, shoot a, if I shoot a cop, I'm dead. Or if I use it against the cops, I'm dead. I still do not see that rhetoric as threatening or making a threat. Um, people are trying to argue that. But either way, according to eyewitness testimony, he did not directly threaten the driver. Even if the driver felt threatened, he did not have a right to shoot, especially when he is the one driving in the vehicle, which is the deadly weapon and threatening protesters. Andre, what are your thoughts on this so far? Uh, I hate the fact when people try to make excuses for uh, bad behavior. Obviously, um, like you already stated, it's his right to carry, to open carry state. Uh, you have to know the provisions of um, what constitutes uh, self-defense. Yep. Seeing, seeing someone with an AR-15 does not constitute self-defense. Well, and especially in Texas, I mean, those of you that don't live here, especially in um, more southern areas like Austin, San Antonio, Houston, it's not uncommon to see people walking around with their guns holstered. Now, I don't particularly see a lot of people walking around with AK-47 style rifles. However, it is still legal. As well as when we are seeing these protests get violent, we have video documentation of these violent protests doesn't matter whether you want to argue who's starting the violence there is evidence enough that a lot of these protests have had some semblance of violence at certain points so if I were the fiance of a quadriplegic who is out there you know trying to exercise our first amendment and second amendment rights and fight for justice and fight against police brutality I would probably have my gun too especially if I had been out there for 51 days and at some point they're basically telling them, you can't march in the streets anymore. Well, if we're not allowed to have our rights, then at some point the argument that I always hear from Second Amendment advocates, NRA advocates, is, you know, in case we ever need to overthrow the government or we need to protect ourselves against the government who out, you know, weaponizes us as far as tanks, surveillance, and, and weaponry is concerned, then we need to be able to exercise that right. And that's what the clause was originally put in the, um, the Constitution in the first place. And yet I hear silence from those same people. When a white man is killed and um, a veteran, a law-abiding citizen. So that's, I think that's what's most hip hip uh, hypocritical is that there's silence from those groups. And... I at least am, am 
I am encouraged when uh, since that since Saturday, protests have continued in Austin, but they are all shouting Garrett Foster's name. And it is not necessarily against police brutality. He did not die at the hands of police. However, the police are seemingly protecting his assailant by not releasing the name, not, you know, not by releasing him while there's a pending investigation going on. So it is a little bit troubling, in my opinion. All right. Uh, any more Texas news for today or? Yes. So let me, let me scooch over and add this real quick. So um, this is more in regards to ICE. Um, very recently, this is somewhat related, but very recently there were reports of the um, about 3,000 children from these um, detention centers at the border that are missing. Um, uh, some of them have been alleged to have been trafficked. And that's why this story is equally as troubling. So I'm going to read you a little bit about what's going on in McAllen, Texas. And this is also going on in Arizona, specifically with Hampton Inns, um, which is owned by Hilton. So um, in McAllen, Texas, uh, Hilton Hotels and Resorts denounced late Friday the use of South Texas Hampton Inn as a detainment center for migrant children. The same day, civil rights attorneys sued the government after going viral on social media when they tried to contact the children and were forcibly thrown out of the hotel by three men who refused to identify themselves. Hilton said its hotel in McAllen is independently owned and managed and that it accepted reservations from a private contractor working for the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, to house migrants that are being transported. To quote uh, the company, this is not activity that we support or in any way want to be associated with our hotels. Our policy has always been that hotels should not be used as detention centers for detaining individuals. We expect all Hilton properties to reject business that would use the hotel in any way. Hilton, uh, did, uh, Hilton said it did not facilitate the reservations or have the enterprise agreement with the contractor, later identified by ICE as a private security firm, MVM. Hilton said the hotel owners have since canceled the business and that the detainees are no longer at the hotel. Their current whereabouts is still unknown as this story continues to be investigated. Um, which is important to note as well. We still do not know where those um, detainees are. The about face comes one day after attorneys with the nonprofit Texas Civil Rights Protection uh, or Projection uh, Project, sorry, tried to enter a floor where the children were being held. And in a 30 second video that's posted on Twitter that we can link later, an attorney is confronted by three men as they step off the elevator. After the men refuse to answer his questions about their identity or if they are police, the attorneys yell down the hall in Spanish and in English for the detainees to provide him their phone numbers if they are being detained. So there's uh, there's been some protests down in McAllen as well um, after a viral video was showing the um, detainees holding up signs in the window saying, we have no phones, they won't let us talk, please help us. Um, What's most troubling to me is that ICE has employed or contracted a separate transportation company that they say from as far as their credentials, they are not listing their credentials or involvement. They're not a government agency to our understanding. And they are in unmarked vehicles, unmarked white vans. And they're alleging that they have worked with children before, but that's the only credentials that were given when it comes to this private contracting transportation group that is being taking these detainees to the country of origin. Why are they not being held in the facilities that are, regardless of whether these facilities are up to par to our standards as far as humane ethics and morality, they are, we do still have government facilities where there are some government protections, there are uh, supplies for the COVID pandemic, and for them to be housed in these hotels, not with no advocates, no social workers, no one that is there to allegedly be able to provide um, medication for them, food. These children are being traumatized 
and we're not getting any answers. And the uh, ICE officials are not giving up the identity or the credentials of this private group that they were somehow allowed to not only contract and employ, and then make these reservations at the Hampton Inn. It's similarly to Arizona. Um, thoughts on this initially, Andre? Where'd you go? I lost you. I'm still here. I'm still here. You didn't lose me. You didn't uh, lose me at all. And in fact, um, I was having a conversation with uh, someone who is going to be on our news uh, broadcast real soon on the Rise Up uh, segment real mm -hmm. soon. Um, so stay tuned for that, by the way. And uh, my thing is, these detainees that you're speaking of, Aren't some of them contracting COVID-19? Because there's been reports. Uh, there was a report June 25th that says 11 Texas immigrant detainees test positive for COVID-19. That wouldn't shock me at all. And, and, and with this separate facility now in a hotel where there's no um, checks and balances and no accountability from any other government officials, regardless of whether we think the government was doing what they were supposed to be doing in the first place, in our own detention centers, we have less likelihood of those being enforced or, or taken care of in these private hotels. And then again, being taken off by these vans, which these people won't even identify themselves. I guarantee you they're not supplying um, PPE or sanitization. Um, I don't think they have um, proper supplies. Um, as, and what's, what's most troubling, too, is in 2017, Governor Abbott of Texas um, made uh, quite the statement about really cracking down on uh, chi uh, child trafficking, sex trafficking in Texas in 2017. A few bills have been introduced in 2018. However, not much has changed and the numbers continue to rise. And the bigger concern, as well as with COVID, I know there's a lot of debate about whether we should reopen the public schools. I know Governor Abbott has allowed for that, for the districts to make their own decisions. And I personally think that that there's, again, it's, we're always stuck in these choices of the lesser of two evils. While I think that there is a more higher likelihood of COVID contraction and sickness, but what's important to know about when it comes to reports of child abuse a lot of the people that end up reporting child abuse or suspected child abuse are teachers because a lot of times children are abused or trafficked through people they actually know, whether it's in, especially in the foster care system um, because there's always a little bit of short staffed issue when it comes to CPS. Now that these social programs like YMCA, all sorts of these places, after school programs where children are uh, less likely to be able to go because of COVID, we have less and less likelihood of people being able to see the signs of abuse and report it because the children are being isolated away from that. And now with them being placed in hotels, there's le less likelihood for transparency for people to be able to see whether these children are being advocated for or taken care of. It's and especially because they're migrant children, we all know that us versus them mentality, I think that they see them as less than or not American or whatnot. And so people are less and less likely to speak out against it. So that's very concerning, um, not just from the contracting of COVID with this particular case in McAllen, as well as Arizona, but also the way that we are just okay with this. And we're just, you know, uh, yes, there are protesters. Yes, there are people speaking out. But how did this happen in the first place? How did we have this outside contractor be allowed to just roll up in and make reservations for the Hampton Inn, put a bunch of kids there and then deport them? And no one's talking about where they even went. Hampton or Hilton is just coming in saying, well, we're not booking reservations anymore. Well, that's not good enough. How did this happen in the first place? Where's the check and balances? Again, where's the accountability? Absolutely. Wow. Wow. It's very upsetting. Y'all better, better get real used to uh, this right here. What you are watching is what you are watching is news at its finest right here. Uh, Stephanie Tavley in the building. Definitely right here bringing it full circle. Texas news. Uh, Stephanie, 
tomorrow we're gonna have some more Texas news, I'm sure, on the way. A whole lot of a whole lot of Texas, Texas down home news <laughs> coming up. Um, we appreciate we appreciate you guys supporting us uh, on Facebook. Definitely continue to support uh, as Stephanie Tapley is our new anchor, news anchor. So support, support, support. And uh, by the way, yeah. shout out to Selena Cyber, who is yeah. still with Bringing It Full Circle News. She is on the field working on Wisconsin uh, News. Shout out to her. Uh, she's phenomenal, too. I miss her already. Um, All right. There is some Alabama breaking news that uh, I meant to uh, share. Breaking news. 59 minutes ago, Governor Ivey in Alabama just had a press conference. Mask order is extended until August 31st and the push to get children uh, into school with necessi uh, ne necessity with a necessity of requirements that need to be met. So there's your breaking news right there. Governor Ivey actually doing something in in Alabama. Stephanie Tapley, what's going on? Bring it full circle news. How are you? Have, are, are you having fun? I am. Doing? Seeing that uh, uh, sports um, plug makes me think, woo, NFL season's going to be interesting this year. And oh, whole yeah. new set of rules, I feel like. Well, well, since we want to talk about the NFL real quick, uh, I did not add this in the new segment, so I'm going to add this, though, because this is a segue to what, what was just said by uh, yours truly, Stephanie Tapper. Uh, star defensive... Hmm, notice I said star. Um, defensive end for the Buffalo Bills has opted out of the 2020 football season. Star Tudelay has opted out from the Buffalo Bills this season. Um, Star Twitter lately is getting paid about eight to nine million dollars a season. Uh, he is not willing to risk, uh, take the risk. He will not be playing. Totally understand. Um, but here's what I will say Bill's Mafia, put some lights on ours in the air for your Western New York news because here it comes right now. Um, cut him. That's it. That's all I'm gonna say. I will give you more information on, on sports shows as they uh, pertain to one Buffalo Bills. Um, defensive end start to the lady. We will talk about him on Sunday. All right. Make sure you watch that show that you just seen the commercial for. All right. Buffalo Bills edition of Rise Up Early. All right. Now, now that we got that out of the way, we need to talk about something that's very serious. Buffalo Soldiers Day, folks. By the way, Buffalo Soldiers Day commemorates the formation of the first regular army regiments uh, compromising African American soldiers in 1866. They earned a reputation for serving courageously while protecting settlers on the West Front and in battles like Battle of San Juan Hill. All right. Tomorrow, to kick off our Western New York news, I will have a video showing you um, some footage of that um, from, you know, Buffalo Soldiers Day. Um, we want to commemorate and give uh, respect to the Buffalo Soldiers, as we give respect to all of our military who protect and serve. Thank you. All right. More news, more news down the hatchet. Down the hatchet. I, you know what? I'm going to be honest. With you. Sometimes I don't even know where to begin with Buffalo, Western New York news. There's going to be one week where I'm not going to have a story, and I'm going to be super happy about it. Really. I'm going to be super happy. I'm just going to jump up and down and play Bill's Mafia's music uh, music, music during the uh, segment. Stephanie, mm -hmm. you ready for this one? This right. one is a, is, a, is a dandy. Quite a dandy. Is it depressing? Right. Oh, no, it's not depressing. Good. It ain't, it ain't my, depressing. My are pretty depressing, so I always like when there's a little bit of a silver lining. But... This guy right here, I actually was probably about a thousand feet away when this happened. Right here. Uh, federal judge blocks pretrial release of Buffalo City Hall arson suspect. Uh, a couple months ago, there was peaceful protests going on, and this guy, who the mayor legitimately uh, made a video for, quoting the idiot who decided to throw a fire in, in a city hall 
we got you on camera. The idiot. Okay? Exactly what he said. And I quote, you can go watch it on uh, YouTube. Go just type up the mayor's rant. Um, it was, yeah, it was very majoral of him. Um, on June 22nd, a judge ordered Cortland Renfro, uh, Renfrew, the man accused of starting a fire in City Hall, to be released to a family member for home confinement as he awaited trial. Mm -mm -mm. Federal judge has now blocked that decision, ordered Renfro to be uh, detained until trial. Means you're going to sit in jail. But um, Renfro is accused of starting a fire uh, following a protest in response to the death of George Floyd. The attorney for Renfro submitted a motion of release in June under the change of circumstances submission that uh, listed the mother of Renfro's sister being the person who would be accountable for him on the release. The motion indicated Renfro would live with his father. In addition to the change of circumstance, Renfro's attorney also submitted evidence showing the damage inside City Hall. In court, I believe the government stated where there was thousands of dollars in damage uh, where the fire was posited, deposited into Buffalo City Hall. I have attached this image, which shows that this may not be true. If I showed you the photo, this doesn't look like thousands of dollars of damage, folks. This looks mm, very suspicious. Uh, the judge still ruled, uh, the judge ruled in favor of Renfro, allowing him to live with his father upon release on a $20,000 bail. Renfro was ordered to be in home incarceration as motion continued in the case. But then according to court documents filed in the U.S. Attorney's Office Tuesday, the government argues that the conditions of the release will not uh, be reasonable assured that the defendant's appearance is as required or reason, uh, reasonability uh, assured the safety of the community pending the, the trial. So the court documents uh, say that the evidence Renfro committed the arson is substantial and he may face a mandatory minimum of five years in prison if he is convicted. Therefore, the court states incentive for Renfro to flee. The trial is real. In which blocked as all I can say, blocked and they used his criminal history as well, uh, provided as reasoning to block his pretrial release. Blocked. Seven letters. Stars will be ends with D. Um, how do you feel about it? I have a lot of opinions about it, but I think um, the biggest the biggest str struggle with a lot of these cases, a lot of these cases in various different um, parts of the world, is it, it really goes back to our 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 laws and our mandatory minimums, the Justice Department. I I, I don't have as much faith in our um, Justice Department to <laughs> run fairly. So that that's my biggest struggle on on so many of these cases is it's we've we've made things complicated that don't need to be complicated. We've we've built a system that Frederick and I talked about this the other day. We've we've made things so complicated that there's all these loopholes and checks and balances and and but they're not really checks and balances. I'm going to be rambling at this point, so I, I want to make sense, but. We've made things so complicated that true justice either takes years or or it's it's not fair to the actual um, defendant or it is is not harsh enough. I don't even know where to start, and it's and it's across the board. So it's 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 an issue in so many different areas where our our laws are so complicated, and there's not enough clear. Uh, you, see, you get what I'm saying? Am I making any sense or am I just at this point? Woo, I've lost you, it. You, you, make, you make sense. You make a perfect sense. Speaking That's of making it. sense, speaking of making sense of laws and things of that nature, the Buffalo Common Council needs to make sense of this Carol's Law coming up. By the way, we've had her on uh, bringing it full circle uh, during peaceful protests. She is, she is a police officer who was fired for intervening in activities that would be conducive of 
excessive force by other police officers. She was fired for it and lost her pension. The Buffalo Common Council met Tuesday afternoon to discuss ways to draft what some would call Carol's Law. Uh, Carol's Law is a phenomenal law, by the way. Um, again, I've had firsthand uh, conversations with uh, Carol, Carol Horn. Shout out to her. Um, and thank you for what you're doing in the community here. It is a six-fold uh, piece of legislation which says, number one, mandate an officer's duty to intervene. Number two, consequences if uh, officers do not intervene. Number three, protection for officers who do intervene from retaliation, reassignment, or firing. Number four, consequences for officers who falsify reports for force incidents. Number five, termination for repeat force offenders. Number six, restoration of pension or position uh, for officers who faced retaliation for intervening. No decision was made because the council needed to discuss with its legal branch what law, what parts of law can be impeded at the local level without the power of the state law behind it. Sounds like a floozy. Sounds like the uh, common council is being floozy. Um, in a nutshell, Members also asked for legal, uh, asked legal for information regarding which body has power to discuss a reinstate pension. Reinstate her pension, man. Stop playing. Uh, Carol Horn is a former, uh, like I said, police officer who said she was fired after stepping uh, into a uh, stop after an officer was placing a man in a chokehold. They got that infamous chokehold again. All right. The Common Council is hoping to draft the law by the end of the week and will vote in resolution after its August recess. It's again one of those base. It's to me basic employment law here in Texas. If I had to make a report against my boss or my direct supervisor, I have protections under the Tex Texas Workforce Commission to not have retaliation, to not be fired for reporting either you know sexual assault in the workplace or sexual harassment, any of those things. Why is that not prevalent within this police force? Why is that not just a general given, an accountability? And like we saw in, I uh, forget which state it was, when uh, during several weeks ago, when uh, the police officer pushed down that 70 year old man and not one police officer, I still wonder, and again, I know there's people on different sides of that. I still wonder, was no one bothering to say anything because they knew they'd be retaliated against? Or is it just this pack mentality, whereas we, we support our own and that's it? But if there has not been some accountability when it comes to falsifying records, when it comes to police brutality and, and overreach, we see that there hasn't been accountability there, but why is it not a general practice of employment law? Because, you know, police force, that's your employment. Why is it not just a given that if you report something that is illegal or is an overreach, that you should have the protections of not being retaliated against? That seems like a, like a duh moment. I don't understand why that was not already in place. That's awesome. Just doesn't make sense. By the way, tomorrow on uh, Western New York in New York News, we will talk about uh, the cocaine situation that is becoming an issue. We'll also talk about the bus state shooting, and we'll talk about COVID-19 as well, and uh, many of other things tomorrow. Wisconsin News. Let's get to it. Wisconsin News, as we uh, finish off our segment tonight, well, today, as we finish off our segment we are going to get into Wisconsin news as it pertains to unemployment claim forms. Yep. Unemployment benefits okayed for people with disabilities in Wisconsin. Yes. Uh, Wisconsin residents who receive disability benefits and who have been denied additional unemployment benefits made available due to the coronavirus pandemic will now receive those payments. The U.S. Department of Labor told the state Department of Workforce Development in a letter Monday that the pandemic unemployment assistance was available to people with disabilities who receive payments through social through SSD, what we call it SSD, which is Social Security Disability. The, uh, that is a reversal from the federal government's uh, initial interpretation of state law. Wisconsin elected officials in Congress, Governor Tony Evers and the Department of Workforce 
Yep, the Workforce Department of Secretary Caleb Frostman had urged the uh, Federal Labor Department to reconsider its initial decision denying the new benefits. Okay? So that happened. That's good. Seems like some places is trying to help uh, folks, by the way, trying to help folks stay on the up and up. Uh, tomorrow on West Wisconsin News, we will talk about the uh, unsolicited seeds in Wisconsin. We will talk about how Wisconsin has passed 50,000 COVID-19 cases after 762 were newly reported. We will also talk about uh, Wisconsin's Chicago top doc as um, they will also talk about the COVID-19 quarantine order uh, that is in play. All right. So with that being said. You can hit us on BIF's uh, circle on Twitter. This has been a whole lot of fun. Yes, it has. Stephanie Tavley is in the building. Uh, phenomenal job today. Phenomenal, phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody for everything uh, that you do as far as bringing it full circle is concerned. Continue to support us on Facebook, on Twitter, and um, yeah, let's continue to bring real news. All right. I'm Andre. I'm Andre Robinson. I'm Stephanie Tapley. And of course, we will see you tomorrow. All right. We will see you tomorrow.